morning, church. It is so good to be back um, with you sharing. It's nice to always have a break from behind the computer. So thanks to Jared, who is uh, pulling, pulling the weight on that one there for me. Um, but I don't know about you, I've really been enjoying this series in Ecclesiastes. It's not really a book that um, I've actually studied previously in depth or really looked at um, in much detail before, but I feel like it's just so relatable and so honest in um, the language that he uses. Like, he doesn't mince his words at all. He's just very, very honest. And I think that brutal honesty, um, the, the honesty about the reality of life, is probably what we need during a time like this, a time of restriction or lockdown, um, so that we're actually able to sort of reprioritize and almost recalibrate the rhythm of our life. And the teacher writing Ecclesiastes, um, who we're pretty confident is Solomon, Um, is taking us on a journey through his own sort of processings and learnings after a life of um, extravagance. He's so wealthy and he's indulged himself and he's achieved such great success. And as Mark laid it out um, so well for us last week, Solomon lived an epic life. Everything he did was epic. There was nothing that he lacked, yet as he gets closer to the end of his life, he realises that everything he's experienced everything that he's achieved, everything that he has accumulated, all he has done is vanity. That's his favorite word in this book, vanity. The Hebrew word haval, meaning vapor or breath or wind. Something that lasts no longer than a moment before it just disappears, dissipates without a trace. Meaningless, empty, unfulfilling, vanity. So he started in chapter 1 asking the question about life itself. Is life itself vanity? Saying that there's nothing new under the sun. Life just goes around and around just as the sun goes up and goes down or the wind blows north and blows south. Life just goes around and around. Is life itself vanity? He says wisdom and knowledge is vanity. That in and of itself, these two things are meaningless and are actually only going to bring sorrow. Then he says self-indulgence and pleasure is vanity. So he sort of comes to this conclusion that everything under the sun is vanity. Wisdom, knowledge, pleasure, even life itself can be meaningless. So he's pretty much saying that I'm going to die, you're going to die, we're all going to die, and everything that happens under the sun, even maybe life itself, is vanity. In 2.17 he says, So I hated life because of what is done under the sun was so grievous to me for all is vanity and striving after the wind. Pretty depressing couple of chapters, don't you think, already? But there's little glimpses in these passages and what we're going to look at um, towards the end of the message today as well, which sort of shows us that all may be vanity unless we're able to look beyond the sun, not at just what is under the sun, but what is beyond the sun. If we're able to look to God, then and Only then will we be able to find true and lasting meaning in this life and in things of this life. So now we're at the end of chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. Um, And what Solomon is going to do is shift his focus towards the idea of work. Is work vanity as well? Maybe in work he could find his meaning. Maybe in work we can find our meaning and purpose and fulfillment. And I think it's understandable that This is one of the big topics that he wants to ask a question of and tackle in this moment. This question of vocational work. I mean, this is where so many people today look to try and find their identity or their fulfillment or their sense of meaning in life. And we know this because, I mean, what's the first question you would usually ask someone you've just met? Usually probably within the first 60 seconds is, well, what do you do for work? What industry are you in? And even more so, look at how we respond to that. We respond with an identity statement. We say, I am a pastor. I am a teacher. I am an electrician. And all of a sudden, we've identified ourselves as human doings instead of human beings. See, even though theoretically we may know that we are human beings, we can actually identify ourselves as human doings through the work and through that value we've placed on our work. But fortunately for us, Solomon is going to help us to understand that ultimately, if we attach ultimate purpose and meaning to our work, then we're going to arrive at the same place that all of the other tests arrived at as well, a place of disappointment and dissatisfaction. 
But before we open up the text together, I just want to affirm right from the start that yes, work can be vanity, but then we can also find meaning in the gift of work. Because work itself isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. I mean, the goal of my message this morning isn't to try and convince as many of you as possible to quit your jobs, even if some of you may want to hear that this morning. But the goal is to show you that through the example of Solomon, work has immense value as a gift from God rather than a source of identity or fulfillment. So we'll open up the scriptures now and it'll be up on the screen um, from chapters 2 verse 18. Solomon says, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labours under the sun. Because sometimes a, a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. See, Solomon's main reason here for saying that work is vanity is because of this realisation that everything that he has done, everything that he has worked for and accomplished and achieved, once he is gone... He's just going to pass that on to somebody else when he dies. And for that reason, he, he hates his, his work. And he even says, well, what if the person who comes after me is a fool? Like he's going to have to pass it on, but also there's a chance that everything he's tried to achieve could be destroyed in a moment of foolishness from the person who takes after him. He said that his work is full of vexation. I mean, add that word to your vocabulary. Today, I'm, I'm feeling vexation about my work. And his days are full of sorrow. Even at night, he could not rest. So he's saying work is hard. Work is frustrating. It's taxing. It involves great sacrifice. It consumes your mind. And then at the end, you just pass it on to somebody else who could lose it all. I mean, how often do you miss out on sleep because of work-related anxiousness or work itself? I mean, once you've finish work for the day, you come home to do the work that you didn't get done at work, and then maybe once you finish that work, you move on to a different type of work, like an assignment work or um, uh, essay work or whatever, and then once you finally finish that work, then you go to bed anxious about the work that you didn't complete that day and the work that is to come. We're just in this perpetual cycle and this state of work, 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 and it can be monotonous. He's saying it's vexation. What's the point? Why do we even bother when we look at work through the lens of our own mortality and the reality that we are going to die? What does it all come to? And as well suited to your job and as much as you may love the work that you do, I'm sure you're all going to have days that feel like this, that feel vexing. And if you say you never do, then I bet you're lying. But work can be monotonous. You get up, you do what you need to do, you get paid to put up with the people that you have to put up with. You leave, you go to sleep, you wake up, you do it again. You may change jobs, change careers, change environments, but ultimately, if you are going to be looking for ultimate meaning and lasting identity or purpose or anything like that in your work, you will be left disappointed. And then if you try and put that meaning maybe in the fruit of your work, what you could achieve, that too will leave you disappointed. Because that fruit, like I said, somebody may just take it and destroy it, or in years to come, your name and probably the fruit of your work as well will just become irrelevant. It'll be forgotten. Work as a source of meaning is complete and utter vanity. Now, some of you may know, but throughout high school, I had my heart set on working as a professional sportsman. I wanted to play cricket as my career. I mean, it sounded like the best job in the world, traveling around, getting, good, um, getting paid good money to do something that I loved. And towards the end of high school, God started to sort of work on my heart to show me that working as a professional um, athlete wasn't, there all, wasn't all there was to life. 
And part of this journey was to hear from an ex-professional athlete um, called Peter Pollock, a South African cricketer. And he came to speak at, um, to young Christian athletes about his experience in professional sport. And I will never forget what he said at that conference. He said he sacrificed so much. Waking up early, training, playing every single day for years, always looking towards that next selection, trying to climb the ladder just one step higher, one step higher, one step higher. And during the hardship of professional sport, he tirelessly worked towards his goal of becoming the best in the world in his discipline. And eventually, he arrived. He got there. He became the best in the world in his discipline. He was a household name. And he told us at this conference, and I'll never forget the line that he used, but he told us that when he realized there was nothing more he could achieve, there was no further team to be selected for or something else to be achieved, he realized that there was nothing up there. He said there was nothing up there. And that line, it's always stuck with me and it, it rattled me in that moment, the, the dream of a professional athlete. How could it be that once you finally realized that dream and achieved everything you've ever wanted, that there's still just nothing up there? It's emptiness. It's unfulfilling. And he wrote um, a book about his journey to faith and how he never sort of found that fulfillment in his sport. Um, and in his book, in a chapter titled Solomon's Folly, he concluded that we've been sold the great American dream. It's all about being born and educated into and climbing this great ladder of success to fame and fortune with the dream that one day we will reach the top, we will have peace and fulfillment. It's a lie. It's a false promise, a deceitful expectation. It does not matter how much money we make, how much fame we achieve, we cannot find peace and fulfillment outside of God. God has set eternity on the hearts of men and that void, that emptiness, can only be spiritually satisfied. See, all work, even work that seems to elevate us in society or compensate us with great wealth, all work in and of itself, without any understanding of why or who we work for, is vanity. It cannot provide any sense of eternal peace or satisfaction because one day when you're gone, your name, your work, the fruit of your labor, will largely be forgotten and irrelevant. And this is what Solomon is trying to tell us. He's trying to say that there is nothing up there. If that's all you're chasing for, know that there is nothing up there. And if you're me reading this passage, you're probably thinking, well, what about all that work that just seems so life-changing and so good that, you know, it's work for the kingdom or it serves the, um, the needs of the poor or it brings great justice into this world? Or what if it's a job that you're just working so hard at so that you can lovingly care and provide for your family? And what I want to say to that is both are great. Work is great in that sense. And that is what God would want us to be doing. He's pleased by that. But let's be real here, and I don't want to insult anybody with this statement, but God doesn't need you to complete what He wants to do in this world. He doesn't need you. That would make him dependent on us. And if he is dependent on us, then he's less than God. But just because he doesn't need us, doesn't mean he doesn't want us. He invites us, he lovingly and carefully invites us into his type of work. He allows us to participate in this divine redemptive plan for the world, for his glory and for our good. And he loves it when we are engaged in work. See, it's not us doing the work that will ever give us the satisfaction because it's vanity. But it is the one who we work for, or in Paul's language, the one who has enlisted us. It is in that that we are able to find true and eternal meaning and satisfaction. So what we're sort of beginning to see here right from the start is that yes, work under the sun without understanding of why or who we're working for, without any consideration of eternity, is vanity. But that does not mean that work is not good. That does not mean that work is not valuable or meaningful when we are not looking to it for a source of fulfillment. So start thinking now as we continue through, what is, why is it that you rock up to work? What are you hoping to gain by being there? How would you view yourself and understand your role and your purpose in this life apart from the work? that you do. 
So Solomon's been ranting for almost two full chapters by this point. And he leaves us wondering here for a second. If, if wisdom, if pleasure, if vanity, if self-indulgence, if success or achievement or work, whatever it is, if it's all vanity, then is there any hope? Is there any hope for somebody who has tried it all and realized that it all adds up to a grand total of nothing? And the answer is yes. You see, in these last few verses, Solomon shows up and gives us a glimpse of what he actually believes, what he actually knows to be true. And there's no smooth transition or clever literary device here. He just stands up and he cuts through that despair. He cuts through that grief with glimpses and rays of optimism. He's going to point us now to a God who is good. He's going to point us to a God who is just and is gracious and is merciful and is kind and generous. A God who is above the sun and therefore a God who is able to give us meaning to everything underneath the sun. Verse 24 says, There is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? So Solomon's been grieving and lamenting, but then he just switches. And he says, well, just go and enjoy and eat and drink and enjoy your work and enjoy it all. And it feels like two completely different narratives. Like, which one is it? Which one are we supposed to believe? Why do they seem so different? And what made the difference between sort of why bother it's all meaningless and actually go out and enjoy and do and eat and drink? Well, I think what Solomon's trying to do here is make a distinction between chasing after life, like chasing after the wind, or receiving life and all that life has to offer as a gift from the hand of God. See, joy, satisfaction, this sense of purpose or identity that we're all chasing is, is not something that we will ever be able to earn ourselves, but it is something that we receive from the hand of a good and gracious God. Solomon's no longer searching for ultimate fulfillment in the gifts, but he's then receiving with gratitude from the hand of the giver. And it's only from this new reality that the gifts of life, including work, add to our life now in beautiful and meaningful ways. When we realize that life under the sun isn't all there is to life as a whole, then suddenly everything becomes meaningful again. Life is to be received, not to be chased. Ray Steadman, um, an author and pastor, beautifully said this. He said, isn't it strange that the more you run after life, panting after every pleasure, the less you find? But the more you take life as a gift from God's hand, Responding in thankfulness, responding in thankful gratitude for the delight of the moment, the more that seems to come to you. See, if God is not the defining center of our lives or the source of our identity, we're going to take good things like wisdom and knowledge and pleasure and work and turn them into God things. And those are ultimately going to leave us disappointed because they're not God. They can't provide what we are looking for in them. Another commentator, Andrew Knowles, wrote on this passage saying, There is a world of difference between a life of mindless drudgery. You feel like that sometimes? Mindless drudgery. And life as a God-given gift. See, without God, we invest our life in gathering and heaping like occupational therapy to fill the time. Working so hard without purpose or hope is empty and meaningless. But with God, there's an exciting dimension to life which is endlessly intriguing and fulfilling. Life that is endlessly intriguing and fulfilling. So what we've learned from Solomon at this point is that work is vanity when we are looking to it for our ultimate meaning and purpose. But also that work is a gift from God that we can receive and we can enjoy. But maybe as some of you have experienced recent birthdays or Father's Days, maybe not every gift is of the same value. I mean, you've probably recently received a gift that maybe wasn't even worth the value of the time it took to wrap them. But some gifts are worth immeasurable value. Some gifts are worth sentimental value, especially when you understand the heart behind the, the one who is giving you that specific gift. 
So it raises the question, if work is vanity and then work is a gift, why this gift? Why does God give us the gift of work and what value is it for us? Well, we'll find out in this last uh, verse of chapter 2, Solomon writes, For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. So at face value, this seems like a pretty confusing verse. At least for me, it was. I was reading lots and lots and lots of commentaries trying to work out what is going on here. But I realise that maybe I'm just sort of, I'm, I'm overcomplicating it because um, Solomon here, he uses this language that seems so fitting of a New Testament sort of theology of work. He says that we're actually able to please God with our work. Another way of saying that could be we're able to glorify God with our work. And by glorifying God, we're also acting in our best interest because we will flourish in this life when we live it as God has ordained it for us. And I think lockdown's been a prime example of the impact that um, a work routine has on us. I mean, for those who aren't able to work or for those of us like me who work has sort of been fundamentally changed, we can almost all agree that it's much harder to stay disciplined, to stay focused in all the other aspects of our life when we don't have that consistent pattern of work or study or whatever it is. See, without regular work, we can become mentally and emotionally and physically unhealthy and not to mention the, the financial consequences of not working. So obviously God knew that we needed work, we needed the activity of work to keep our minds and our bodies healthy. And if we look all the way back to Genesis, God ordained work as a fundamental routine of human living. God's first instruction to humanity in Genesis 1.28, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. See, that's, a, that's an instruction to work. And maybe your job isn't as cool as Adam's was, being able to go and name all of the animals. But nevertheless, we're called to work. And just note here, we're still in Genesis 1. We haven't reached Genesis 3 yet. We're still in a Genesis 1, Eden-esque, perfect world, created by God. And that's why I think we can be confident that we will probably work in heaven after this life. Maybe just without all the pain and the drama and the monotony, we will enjoy our work till its fullness and embrace it as God has designed for us back in Genesis 1 in the garden. But if we quickly flick over to the New Testament, we can see how work can also glorify God. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. And then a little bit further down in that passage, verse 23, he says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Whatever you do. That's the statement that's repeated in both of these verses. Whatever you do. Whatever you do is important. Whatever you do has meaning. And whatever you do is an opportunity to bring glory to God. Every action, every task, every project, every placement, every box lifted, every burger flipped, every patient cared for, every wall painted, every email sent is of intrinsic worth. However menial it may seem, it is a potential means of bringing glory to God. And we know from the narrative of, narrative of Scripture that God empowers our work, He rewards us for good work, He cares for us by giving us work, and again He's ultimately glorified through our work. And again, not only glorified in big sort of global impacting, fame, rewarding work that changes lives or does huge big things in the world. He's glorified by any type of work that is done by a humble, faithful and cheerful servant of God who understands who they are truly working for. So did you hear that? God is pleased with you. He's pleased with you in the most seemingly insignificant tasks. He's pleased with you and he wants you to glorify him through whatever it is that you are doing. And I think if we, if we need an example of somebody who has completed his work for the glory of God, empowered by the Spirit and with 
our best interest at hand, we don't need to look any further than Jesus. I mean, our God is a working God. All the way from Genesis 1, we see that God is at work in this world. He's been at work, his, sorry, work is in his nature. And the climax of his work takes place through Jesus' incarnation and death and resurrection. Jesus said in John 4.34, that my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And that will, that work that he was sent to do, was his death and resurrection from the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And without this beautiful work of Jesus Christ, we would be living hopeless, meaningless, unfulfilling, empty lives that are literally vanity. But Christ's death and resurrection now secures our identity. It secures our inheritance as children of God. We can now see ourselves in light of what we already know about eternity. The fact that life under the sun isn't all there is. Rather that life under the sun is an opportunity to get to personally know the God who created you and the God who wants to spend eternity with you. It's an opportunity to bring glory to this God and to be co-workers with Him on this earth. Now, I've been holding on to this one for a few weeks now, probably since I jotted it down in week one. So if you've got a pen, this is gold, straight from the brain of Brad. No, I'm kidding, you don't need to. But hear me out. To find meaning in life under the sun, we must look to the sun. Did you get that? To find meaning under the sun, we must look to the sun. That sun being the son of God, Jesus. To find meaning, we need to look to him. To find fulfillment, we need to look to him. To find satisfaction, we need to look to Him. And He will never disappoint. See, when we do this, we can recognize the immense value of every gift He has given us, including work. And maybe some of us Christians are frustrated or bitter or whatever it is in life or in work because we're trying to do it without Jesus. We're trying to do it without the Son. And I think it's easy for us to compartmentalize our lives, to have a work box and a faith box and a church box and a study box and a family box. But God doesn't want to just sit quietly in a box and wait for you to open it up and dust the top off. And compartmentalizing is making a statement about priority. I mean, which box do you keep closest to you? Which box do you pour your life into? Which box do you always open and engage with? That box, that one that is closest to you, can become an idol. It's just whatever you make number one in life. You can make that work box an idol above God. And God doesn't want that. He desires to be at the forefront of every single aspect of your life. Every decision, every relationship, everything that you engage with in this world, under the sun, including work, God wants to be at the forefront of it. He wants to come to work with you. He wants to empower you to do good work. He wants you to depend on Him. And He wants this for your good and for His glory. So ask yourself, what does your relationship with your work look like at this moment? Is it the place that you're searching for meaning and fulfillment in? Is it the thing that you idolize most and you pour your whole life into without consideration of anything else? Or are you able to find value in your work because you can recognize that it's a gift from God, a gift straight from the hand of a good and holy God? As Solomon would say, is your work just all vanity? Or do you actually enjoy it because you're no longer chasing after everything under the sun or looking to work endlessly to try and find that sense of fulfillment? But instead, you're chasing after the sun, Jesus. These are questions we all have to ask ourselves um, at this moment. And I think, like I said at the start, lockdown has given us the perfect chance to sort of recalibrate, to reprioritize, to have a look at our rhythms, our priorities of life, and to understand that maybe work isn't all there is. Maybe work can be vanity, but when we receive it as a gift, that's when we, we find true value in it. And that's when we can understand who the Son is and the value and the identity and the purpose that we find in Christ alone. So I'm going to finish with the wise words of Tim Keller and then pray for us. He says, only when you know God and only when you see everything in life is a gift of grace through Jesus Christ 
will you find that work becomes satisfying. You won't overwork, you won't underwork, you won't idolize it, and you won't hate it. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are so yeah, well invested in our lives, that you're not just a high and lofty God that is too far to touch or reach or to communicate or to relate with, but that you've come near, that you care for us, you know us better than we could ever know ourselves, and that you decided to give us this gift of work. God, just like anything else in this world, we pray that you would help us not to um, idolize this gift, to turn a good thing into a God thing, but that we would see the value of it, that we would be faithful to work hard and to do it with a cheerful and grateful and thankful spirit without placing it in that number one spot in our life. God, we want you to sit on your throne like you do in our hearts. So Lord God, would you help us to understand that this morning? Would you help us to learn from the example and the lesson of Solomon who experienced it all and came to that realisation that without God, without looking to what is beyond the sun, that everything is meaningless. But with you, Jesus, we can find that sense of security. So I pray for the hearts of each person um, engaged with this service this morning, that that um, sense of hope and identity and security and ultimate true fulfilment is something that no longer has to be chased after, but just received from the good and gracious God that you are. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.